This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Yes, sir. Bingo. Welcome to Think Tech Asia. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Our show today is called 700 Million People in China on the Move, Wanderlust. We're going to talk about all, we're going to talk about China and, and Wanderlust all in the name of patriotism, trying to make a global impact. Patriotism can be a great motivational force. If you want to ask a question, make a comment about this discussion, you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI or call us at 808-374-2014. Our guest for the show, it should be no surprise, is our regular correspondent and contributor, Russell Liu, an attorney, a Hawaii attorney practicing in Beijing. Welcome to the show, Russell. Welcome, Jay. Welcome. Um, aloha from Beijing. Yeah. Where are you now? You look great. Well, I'm right now in the uh, in Beijing, a district called Haidian, known for its universities. Uh, I am at the actual coffee shop of the second largest press publication house in China at the Beijing Foreign Studies University Pub and Press. That looks great. Looks better than Starbucks, if you want to know. So let me say well, some, I, let, go ahead. Well, here's my cup of coffee to you. I'm drinking Americana. <laughs> she, she. <laughs> okay, so I want to just to sort of set the stage here. 700 million people are on the move in China, the largest migration of people. And, um, uh, and around October 1st, which is National Day, that's half the population of China, everyone on the move. Um, this, uh, this migration occurs from October 1st to October 8th. So why are they on the move is one of the questions we're going to ask. Where are they going? How is all this moving affecting them and us? Um, so China's National Day holiday celebrates the country's founding, similar to our Fourth of July Independence Day. Un unlike other countries, such as the U.S., celebrating the Fourth of July with patriotic uh, events and, and parades, China's people celebrate the holidays by travel. They travel, they spend lots of money, and they do shopping, the largest migration and shopping spree in the world, 700 million people. A large number, according to CTIPS, which is China's largest online travel operator, are going to travel overseas for the holidays in exotic places. Six million people are going to travel. The economic effect of the Chinese during this one-week period affects all of us, and it affects all of us globally. So now we're going to find out from Russell what's going on, Russell. Tell us about National Day, and tell us about this huge migration and wanderlust that is affecting the world and changing things in China and everywhere. You know, Jay, I think it's really important to think that from the West, when you hear and you read the press about National Day, you think it as some kind of really patriotic, very military day, but it's really not. Um, you know, China has gone past that point. Uh, I think the perception of many Americans who have never been to China uh, is very different than an American being in China. And I kind of wanted to show everyone what the really is happening on the ground. And um, yes, it is a national day. It's called National Day, Alec, October 1. Maybe the name, there are some mis misunderstanding what it's all about. But let's take a look. We've got a couple of videos here just to show you the people on the move. Russell, what is that, an airport? A lot of people there. You're, you're seeing what it looks like on the travel system in the subways, how many people are traveling around in China. And China has vested so much in the subway systems. And it's so efficient because from the subway, you get to the train directly to the airport. And these people movers have really unified the people. You know, they talk about the China dream. And everything's possible now when they see this and experience this. So what did we see? That was the subway, people online in the subway? Where were, what were they waiting for in the subway? That's, yes, that's the subway that you see. Um, modern subways. 
and you will find the subways, um, I find them uh, a lot much more efficient than I'm in the U.S., mm -hmm. than in New York. New subways, everything's clean. And, you know, for the amount of people in China and Beijing, there's, it's a population of 20 to 23 million people. And just imagine how they have to deal with crowd control every day, security yeah. and crowd control. Yeah. Well, let's take a look at another uh, video you gave us and uh, see how that compares. Okay, we're here live, Think Tank Global. We're here in Beijing, China. This is National Day. Everybody's heading toward Tiananmen, where we're headed to see what's it like in National Day in China. And as you can see, we, and we have here Irene Lee and, and Jocelyn. So we're here now, live at the subway station. Let's take a look what, what it looks like on the subway station as we pan around. And as you can see, it's a crowded day. Okay, Russell, that's impressive too. That's a modern, you know, 21st century subway. Where, where does the subway go? Well, the subway goes all around the city. This is in Beijing. Think of Los Angeles. Imagine the breadth of Los Angeles, and you can get clear across Los Angeles in 45 minutes on a subway. Mm. It's very impressive. And, and you were people saying that the, now, um, it's they're used to that. The train, the trains come every three minutes. Did you say? And they're always there it, on time. Tells you when they're coming. And it's every three minutes, and there are um, signs. There's TV screens along the side of the subway where you're waiting, and it tells you the countdown. You'll see a countdown. It'll tell you blow by blow, three minutes, two minutes, one minute. And you'll then hear the announcement that the train is pulling in from this stop, and it's going to the next stop. Wonderful, fantastic. We don't have that in the U.S. No, and uh, what you, you told me before the show, too, that uh, those uh, subways will take you to the big trains, and I'd like to ask you about the big trains, and uh, they will take you to the airport. So if you're traveling, you just get on the subway, and you're ready to make your trip right from there, no? Right. Well, what I do is I pull my roll-ons, and I just get on the subway, and it takes me from where I'm at across the northern part of the city to the southern rail station. It takes me 30 minutes 30 minutes, and then I simply roll my luggage right off the subway. I take up the escalator, and I'm at the train station. I roll up right past the security checkpoint, and I, I just check right in at the gate. Um, it's like this all over China, not just Beijing. Last week, I went to a northern city of Jinan in Shandong. Normally, it would have taken five hours, um, but this took only two hours on the high-speed train. Yeah, those are the fastest trains in the world now, aren't they? They're faster than the TGV in France and any other place. Yes, they just unveiled their latest uh, high-speed train. Uh, it it uh, is the fastest bullet train in the world. Uh, and um, that service, especially if you're in China, um, it's wonderful to take it from Beijing to Shanghai. And it's, it's probably faster than taking an airplane. Airplanes, you have security check, you have delays. And by the time you get all in place and then you fly, um, you're probably there on the bullet train. Well, I just want to uh, get the dynamic of this. A few years ago, say 10 or 20 years ago, uh, despite the fact they had National Day then too, people did not travel in the same way, the same scope, the same distances, the same speeds, with the same money in their pocket. Uh, so this is all fairly recent, isn't it? Yeah, yes, uh, the China National Day, really, it, it, 1949, when the first National Day, and National Day was on October 1, although the founding of the country's action is September 24th, 1949, October 1. So every year they've been having this um, celebration. And in 1999, the government changed it. China is a very practical place. So they said, well, we're going to take a look at this. And what they did was the modern day uh, National Day is not like it was 1949. It's a time where the government says, okay, for all you people, now that we've got this wonderful transportation system, we want you to see your country, experience your culture. People from outside of Beijing will come to Beijing. Uh, we want to make the country unified. 
second, it's, they found it's a great way for domestic spending. They spend a lot of money. Mm. 700 million people coming to Beijing, and 6 million will go abroad outside of Beijing, and they will travel. But it brings about $100 billion domestically. Oh, just yeah. For this one well, week this is period. part of uh, Hu Jintao's uh, uh, initiative to increase uh, local spending, lo local import, lo local consumption of goods. Uh, before it was all an export economy, he wanted to make a make it a local consumption kind of economy and have the people in China buy Chinese goods. And the one way to do that is to have them travel around the country and go on a shopping spree, no? Yes, that's right. And, and, and this is also called Golden Week. And because it's the largest retail spending week, uh, one of the weeks of the year, 14% of domestic tourism spending occurs during this seven to 10 day period. And in fact, people don't just go to the malls, they go out to eat lunch and they sit there, get their smartphones and they order things. So it's a society that's not really brick and mortars. So just imagine the malls are busy, people are buying and people are outside on the street with their with their mobile phones. And and you might think it's hard, it's hard for Americans to understand this, but I think we've got a video that I've got here, um, which shows how the Chinese um, don't need to go to malls. And this is over lunch with three of my local uh, guides that I went lunch, and I saw a plate that I wanted to buy at the restaurant. And so what they did was they showed me how they used their mobile phone, um, got on Alibaba's uh, in engine site, took a picture, and simply it came up where to order, and it, I could just order right there. In the restaurant? That, from the restaurant? In the restaurant, from the wow. restaurant. So I think we have that next video. Yeah. Hi, this is Russ Lu back with ThinkTech with my two guests, Irene Lee and Jocelyn here. Um, and we're gonna show you how much e-commerce and technology is merged together in the daily lives of everyday Chinese. So while we're sitting here at a restaurant waiting for lunch, I commented how beautiful this plate looks like. And Miss Irene is gonna show us how the Chinese use technology so you're able to, to buy, buy it online instantly and make a purchase. So anyway, Irene, show us, show for our audience, what are you using, your smartphone? Yeah, my smartphone. There's an show. app called Taobao, which is, the, which is from the Alibaba company. So everybody's heard of Alibaba and you, I see that? Now what she's gonna do is, she's identified the plate, this is the plate I'm that- I'm going I'm to take a picture of the plate and then they can identify this item instantly on, uh, online. So right now I'm taking a picture of the plate. And this is scanning the item. And you can see they are all the plates we found. So instantly you can get whatever you want when you see it and you can make a purchase online. So in other words, for our audience, this means that you don't have to go to brick and mortar's place. Mm -hmm. You don't have to waste time. It's efficient. All we and did was take a picture. It's even cheaper on the internet. So for, for this plate, it's only 10 RMB, which is awesome. So I think I'm going to order some. Irene, don't close that out. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to order some plates. And the plates, when I ordered, how long will it take to get the plate? Only two days. But if you buy something from Beijing, from the same city, you'll get this next day, like just one day away. So here we are in the Hutongs having lunch, having a conversation, and being able to shop. Now that's what I call efficient. In China, where technology has merged into the daily lives of everyday Chinese, technology, using your smartphone, you don't have to go to a shopping mall. And it's efficient because I'll have next day delivery, and it's exactly. cheaper. So anyways, again, Russ Liu on the road in Beijing. It's National Day in China. We're here, um, it's going to set this all in Beijing to show you what the daily life of the Chinese are. We'll see you later, goodbye. Wow, Russell, that's pretty impressive. It doesn't matter where you see it, it'll recognize it and it'll send it to you. That's, uh, that's um, what's his name, Ma? Uh, in uh, Alibaba, what he's 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 eclipsed Amazon, hasn't he? Yes, and um, so that is incredible, isn't it? That's every day what the Chinese do. They live life very mobile. And that's why they spend trillions of dollars through e-commerce, and it's a big again a big domestic engine that makes the economy run. And so it's 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 part of something where technology this shows about technology so you just saw 
what technology does to a society. Well, I sure it, like it, those it, delivery times, one day in the same city and two days from anywhere else. But I want to add something. You know, we have this possibility, Hawaii has a possibility of having an Amazon center being built here. Okay, and, and you might think that that's a remote possibility, but I, I heard just a couple of days ago that Jeff Bezos of Amazon was here, not a block from where I am sitting. I wonder what he was doing here just a week ago. Isn't that something? Isn't that amazing? Maybe we will have an well, Amazon center right here. Well, that's what I'm saying. If we could bring Amazon to Honolulu, we would bring Alibaba. It will be, be a great global logistics center. And we create special economic zones, bonded zones, so that there are no taxes passing through. But then we hire, we get this economy going. But you know what's important here? It makes everybody from Amazon, that level down to the ordinary person, empowered, empowered to want to do business. Um, next show, I'll show it to you. Um, we were having, before we set up our day trip, we went to a small coffee shop. It was in the basement of the university next to a cafeteria. And you would think, why would this guy be there? And it turned out he makes the best German Black Forest cake <laughs> and chocolate cheesecakes. <laughs> and what he does is, students will go there, and I drank a cup of cappuccino and had your cake. It was wonderful. But you give him two or three hours, he'll take your order. That cake will be made, and it will be delivered to you in two or three hours. So imagine, people are empowered. Um, they're not constricted by expensive motor and brick. And this is the kind of society where money turns, the economy grows. And in sure. the backbone of every society is a small business. Sure. But this is what China is all about. It's happening. It's happening. Everybody in, in China seems to be dedicated to that proposition of let's do local consumption. Let's do national Chinese consumption instead of uh, just import-export. So look, we'll take a short break, Russell. When we come back, I would like to talk about these 700 million people uh, who actually leave China and go flying around the world, uh, you know, getting there with the subway and the high-speed trains and all, getting to the airport uh, and one belt, one road, and see how China is expanding its travel horizons to other countries and other continents. We'll be right back after this short break. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. My friend, mother, what big eyes you have. She said, all the better to see you with, my dear. That's the wolf. What are you doing? Okay, cool. Research says reading from birth accelerates the baby's brain development. And you're doing that now? Oh, yeah, uh, yeah this is the starting line. Hush! Uh, uh, when this is over, you're dead. Read aloud 15 minutes. Every child, every parent, every day. Yeah, we're back. We're live. We're talking to Russell Liu, a Hawaii attorney who practices in Beijing and reports to us every week or two from Beijing. And we get all kinds of interesting information from about how life is, is doing in China and everything is doing in China and affecting the Chinese. And what I love about this show is the people in China watch it. As a matter of fact, the people all over the world watch it. This is one of those special shows, and we have several of them. Uh, that are that are viewed in various countries around the world. Good for ThinkTech and good for you, Russell. So, Russell, tell us about the way the Chinese have expanded their travel horizons to other countries and other continents uh, and, and what that does for them, for their wanderlust, if you will, and for the economy of China as well. Well, it's, 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 it's a very fantastic to see how the Chinese, they have improved their way of life. And they... People work very intensely here, and they look forward to these golden holiday weeks. And this year, there's about six million of them that go abroad. And they do make an impact in other countries. 
In fact, um, recently, um, the press was big news. The Japanese leader, Abe, first Japanese leader in 15 years, first he went to the PRC uh, and congratulated for their founding of their country. Mm. And he wanted to continue with the normalization of relationships. Mm. Notwithstanding what we hear in the press, yeah. all the other things, but, and it's, it's probably because uh, this time of the year, the Chinese flock in big numbers to Japan. Japan is the second uh, uh, most sought after destination in this period. And so they go there, and in 2015, for example, they spent $830 million just in seven days. And this year, it's a lot more. I don't know what the stats will be, but it is um, things like that. They're doing things. And the number one destination last year, believe it or not, was Morocco. Morocco, Morocco went off the, uh, off the scale. But it gives us a good idea of the Hawaii tourism, how we need to think about rethinking of how we attract these tourists. And we need to quickly build capacity because this is the kind of, of uh, travelers we want. The largest spending, they come in big numbers. They give us a chance to breathe. You know, during the holiday periods, New Year, Spring Festival, um, National Day, we can breathe between them. Um, but we want to track big numbers. And again, it really is about what you do to change a product, you know, how to brand it. Yeah, well, so we've talked, you and I have talked about uh, trying to get uh, Chinese signs in the airport, Mandarin signs in the airport, and trying to make the Chinese feel welcome here, as welcome as the Japanese tourists are anyway. But I'm wondering, uh, which, which we haven't really done yet, I'm wondering um, whether uh, Japan, or for that matter, Morocco, have taken affirmative steps to make it comfortable for the Chinese to come. Do they have Mandarin signs? Do they have Mandarin signs in Morocco? I, I, that'd be really interesting. What do they do? Well, well, you know, it's no surprise in Tokyo. I've been to the airports many times at, um, in Haneda, where they did a re, uh, redid the airport. Um, you find live speakers, Japanese, who speak Mandarin. They're all over the airport. You hear loudspeakers in Mandarin. You catch the local airport bus. They have Mandarin tapes on it. And um, it's incredible, but this was something that Japan did not do overnight. You know, when I've been here 15 years, Jay, about 10 years ago, um, the language schools, they would send their middle management, ANA and JL, to Beijing for two years of language training. That's how they would get promoted up the ranks. They foresaw mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, it's this proactive planning. But again, um, the airports uh, in Tokyo have signage, they have language capability they have ticket agents uh, who speak mandarin um and it's, it's sort of like this you got to meet the field before they come uh the american way is well we'll wait till they come if you wait till they come they won't come because it's a word of mouth they use way chat saying this is not friendly this place is not friendly for us mm. but you know i, I gotta give credit the state has done uh and hawaiian airlines has done a fantastic new terminal i was just out there my last trip leaving honolulu <laughs> brand new. It did look very, very nice. But again, we need to, as a community, we need to welcome the Chinese. We need to get the whole airport. You know, uh, if we have Japanese and Korean, we should have China. It's so very important. We need to rethink our strategy. Well, right? what, the key, what is the Chinese I, traveler looking for? <laughs> is he looking to shop? <clears throat> what kind of tours does he want to go on? Uh, what is his taste in hotels? Does he want the top of the line or something else? Uh, what, what is the experience he is seeking? Well, you know, I, I think the, the Hawaii tourism industry is looking for the high spender that's going to stay in the high hotel. But that's not necessarily the guy who's going to spend a lot. I've traveled to Chinese group. They will um, carry $1,000, you know, to buy, for example, Louis Vuitton, to buy Rolex watches. Okay. And that's great for us, too. But we need to welcome them. We need to make them friendly because... But again, the first and last place is the airport. If they don't hear Mandarin, they know they're not welcome. And it's not a matter of uh, favoring one culture or another. It's face. The Japanese, Korean all have the same with the Chinese face. It's a lack of respect. We're the number one travelers around the world, spenders, but you're not willing to welcome us. Yeah. And I think another place is Waikiki, Alamoana Center. You have many Japanese-speaking concierge, but the Chinese don't see any there. I was there uh, a month ago. I, I saw lots of Chinese FIT travelers. They're buying things from Chanel, Gucci, Hermes. But when you walk the mall, 
you're not welcome. And I think we need to start to move in that direction. Sure, we have to compete because there are other places in the world competing. There are other high-end shopping centers elsewhere in every major city. Um, you can go shopping anywhere you want. And find, and find things that equal or rival or exceed what we have at Ala Moana, sorry to say. But yes. let, me, let me ask you about the connection between the, 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 the trip, the experience of the Chinese visitor, wherever he's going, and the economy. In other words, for example, we know the Chinese are investing a lot of money in Africa right now. And, the, and they have you know, companies that are deeply involved with lots of employees and agents all over Africa trying to do resource development, factories, what have you. And that does the, does the tourist, if you will, or the average, call them the average Chinese visitor who goes on National Day to Africa for a trip, what does he do? Is, is that trip connected in some way with the economic activity, if you will, the soft power of China in Africa? No, not really. Um, the Chinese have had been in Africa for, for many, many years. Um, and I, in fact, I just had uh, met a, one of my students uh, who went to South Africa. And um, I think what the Chinese are looking for is a unique experience. Ah. And they want to tie into the local community. They want to absorb that, what the local community. They don't necessarily want the plastic hula dancer dolls. They don't want that. They want to be the real thing. They want something that's interesting, that's kind of a National Geographic kind of experience. Yes. So I think we have to keep that in mind. They want the authentic thing. And I go back to it because what they want is the authentic Hawaiian experience in Hawaii, for example. Yes. Um, and that's why I'm saying is we have to look at our Hawaii tourism. It has to be global, not international. International means we change our tourism product to meet a certain market. We did that with the Japanese travelers. But we need to make it global for everyone. Like wherever you go, Starbucks, you know the, what the latte is going to taste. You're going to ask for a grande size <laughs> latte, right? Sure. Um, so, in other words, we have to globalize. So, the Chinese want that experience. Well, as you know, there's an irony there that they come to buy uh, high-end stuff in Palm Court at uh, you know in Ala Moana, but at the same time, they want <clears throat> an authentic um, experience, a Hawaiian culture experience. Uh, Hawaiian music experience and all that. So it sounds to me from what you say that we have to offer them both. We have to offer them a high-end shopping experience with hotels that meet their budget and their, and their taste. But we also have to uh, offer them the, the natural organic experience of, of the essence of Hawaii. It's not one, it's not the other, it's both. Don't you agree? Yes, Jay. And also, I think another key component is that I was just reading somewhere in fact, I talked to a fellow from Italy, and he said they're going nuts. They, I think it's O4 Mobike. They just opened up in Italy, and the Chinese feel welcome. They will jump on their bikes, and they will start to feel attached to a place, you know. Um, so um, I think if, if Honolulu truly is a global destination, we need to incorporate these elements. We need to get Mobike there. We need to get O4 <laughs> there. We need to use WeChat. We need to be a technology-driven city, like Singapore, what Singapore has done. And, the, and the, in Asia, they will spend more money. Imagine if we could use WeChat in Honolulu, um, a leading place of, of tourism and spending. People will be on the bus, on a tour bus, on their, on their phones, ordering things so that they will buy in advance. And they send to their friends on WeChat, go to this place to eat dinner. Mm -hmm. and. They use technology. We need to be much more technology driven, much more than the other cities in the U.S. If we do that, I will ensure that Honolulu will be a, truly a leading tourism place. We need to push technology. Yes, we have to show that we're innovative else. and we're ahead of the game. <clears throat> they were competing beyond what other other countries and destinations are doing. Um, and I and what you're talking about will attract not only Chinese visitors but visitors from all over Asia actually who have the bucks to come, and for that matter will make make Hawaii uh, a, a better destination for people from the mainland and from Europe and every continent, uh, any continent in the world. But I want to ask you also, what happens after October 8th, Russell? <clears throat> Does everybody go back to work? That's the end of that, uh, and they stop traveling. I mean, is there Chinese travel going on? 
after October 8th is a rhetorical question. What do you think? I think there's always traveling that's going on in, in, in China. I'm at the train stations quite often um, traveling myself, and people are always on the move here. Um, it's just that a mass number comes out in that week because, yeah. you know, for people that work in state-owned enterprise or government companies, they don't have a luxury of saying, I want to take off on November 10th one week to go to Hawaii. They don't have that luxury. So they planned their travel for these periods like uh, National Day, uh, the Spring Festival. So in the scheme of things, if Hawaii wants to be a global tourism place, we need to plan ahead. We need to make it a gala event in Honolulu so that they will uh, um, get on sea trips and book their trips early. Well, that's saying, that sounds the numbers, like they really minimize there. they minimize the risk by doing that. The risk of uh, being, you know, involved in un, unplanned experiences while they travel. But I'm, you know, we live in a dangerous world now. There's always the possibility of terrorism, and some countries have a, a regular diet of terrorism. It seems like, especially in Europe, and now here too. Um, so I wonder how the Chinese deal with that. Are they afraid of that? Do they make their moves to avoid that risk? Do they avoid uh, destinations that have an inordinate risk of terrorism or other difficulties? Uh, or do they cruise right in and go wherever they want to go, not worrying about it? Um, Jay, I'm sorry, I didn't get that feed quite clear. I think you're talking about terrorism. I yeah, think I'm, I'm wondering the how the Chinese, Chinese feel out. about terrorism when they plan their trips. Well, I think when they plan their trip, yes, that is in the back of their mind. And that's a very good question because, you know, we've had a lot of civil unrest in the U.S. So the Chinese actually, that has been a little chilling effect uh, as to them wanting to go to the U.S. We had a bad incident in the University of Illinois, Champaign, where a girl was kidnapped and I believe she might have murdered. Um, so, you know, they had the Charlottesville incident. So the Chinese are aware of all this going on, um, so it does affect them. But that's where Hawaii, I think, uh, to the largest extent, knock on wood, has been fairly lucky. It's a place, a sanctuary of, of peace, calm, uh, and it's a very safe place. So again, that theme should be brought out much yeah. more. Um, the Chinese tourists. Yeah, where the mainland has all these issues, uh, white supremacy issues, racist issues, including not only African Americans, but also Asians. So that would be a bit of a turnoff for a Chinese visitor. But Hawaii has diversity. Hawaii has tolerance. And that means, and I really like your thoughts on this as we close, and that means that we have a great opportunity. We have a great card to play because of our diversity and our tolerance. We are a very appealing destination, are we not, to the Chinese and anyone in, in Asia um, because of that. And do they think about that? Is this an important card for us to play and for them to come here? Yes, Jay, that, that's right. We, it's a place of healing, a good place. And I think we just need, we need to get our community together we need to get our leaders to be hopefully much more engaging and welcoming these tourists because I think that will make a difference. Um, yeah, okay. Very important that we hold that, that thought. Uh, very important here on uh, National Day, but all through the year. Thank you so much, Russell, for joining us and for the clips you, you have and, and for showing us this beautiful coffee shop behind you <laughs> and taking us on a tour as you do every couple of weeks with ThinkTech. May I say, Xie Xie and Sai Jian, Russell Liu. Yes, Xie Xie and Sai Jian. Take care.